All right, so last uh, week on Wednesday, we started to talk uh, very briefly about functions, give a motivation for why you want to create your own functions. Uh, and when you create a bunch of functions together, you're essentially creating your own library. Uh, and that's what we're going to be uh, continuing on today. Uh, and uh, we went through all the reasons that you want to do this. Uh, because it uh, supports code reuse. Instead of having to have the same chunk of code in multiple different places in your program, you put it into a function, and all you have to do is call that function. Uh, it encapsulates functionality so that you don't have to worry about the details. That's procedural abstraction. Again, you don't know uh, how does the square root function work. Who cares? We just need to use it to solve this other problem over here. Uh, only if you actually need to implement that function do you need to worry about it. Uh, and we started talking about how you actually do this in C for user-defined functions. Now, when we say user-defined, what we mean by a user is the actual programmer, not the uh, computer user that's sitting there accessing uh, Amazon.com or whatever. Uh, the user is the programmer. The first thing that you do is that you create what's called a prototype. Remember variables, int x and x, and then later on in the program, x is equal to 10. You can print it out. You can use it in whatever, whatever manner you want. You have to declare a variable before you can actually use it. Same thing with functions. You have to declare a function before you can actually use it in your program. And the way that you declare a function is by using what's called a prototype. A prototype means that you are defining what the function kind of is. What is its return type? What is the name of the function? And what inputs does it take? And here's, our, uh, here's the uh, uh, prototype that we put together last time. Uh, we uh, kind of uh, bookended this to the other discussion on what you were doing with uh, Hack 4 and what we did in class on Wednesday, where we wanted to round descents, right? We have a round function in the math library. Uh, we don't have a round descents function in the math library because, of course, you can write your own, right? Uh, but it might, uh, it might be useful to create a rounding library that has maybe a round descent. Maybe it has, a, you can go the other way, round to the nearest 100th value. So 156 would get rounded up to 200 or something like that. If we find that useful and we use it over and over and over again in our program, then maybe we want to put that into a, a, a well-designed function. Uh, the re you define the return type. The, the, this is just syntax. You define the return type here the name or the identifier of the function, and then in parentheses, any uh, inputs that you need to give. For example, we're going to give it an input with its uh, number 127.58882 or something like that. And then it's going to return a value that is also a double. Uh, that, th that number that you gave it rounded to the nearest uh, cent. Okay? And then at the end, we put a semicolon, because this is a declaration. We're not actually defining what the function does or how it operates yet. We're simply defining what's called the signature of the function. Its return type, its inputs, it, uh, and uh, if there are multiple ones, it'd be a comma de val uh, delimited value or comma delimited list, and the name of the function. In addition to that, documentation is usually written above the prototype. You don't want to include documentation in, uh, in multiple places, so adhere to the DRY principle. Don't repeat yourself. Don't repeat document or yourself right documentation uh, should only be located in one place and the most appropriate place in C is with the prototype right? and so from now on uh, when we say that we're going to be looking for documentation again we're not looking for documentation for every line print F prompt them for input scan F read the input those things don't need to be documented. Code should be self-documenting. Instead, you need to, def uh, to document units of code. An entire program, yeah, have a header up there. Each individual function that you write, yeah, it should have documentation similar to what, what we've got up here. You're telling me what the function does, certain expectations on the function. For example, if you don't want to allow negative values, maybe that you can say no negative values are allowed and you put that into the documentation what happens if i do give it negative values well this is what happens with negative values right it's uh, it's human readable documentation that's intended for other people to read your code or, uh, to read your uh, what what your code does without having to actually go in and look at every single line of your code okay uh, in addition uh, later on in the program you actually define what the function does Right. And we'll discuss where that should be exactly. Uh, but for example, round descents. Let's do that, that one. Example, 
uh, you, you, you repeat the, proto uh, the, sig uh, the function signature and provide a function body. Right? And what I mean by that is simply let me go into code mode here. Uh, here's some C code. And I'm going to repeat the, prototype, the signature here, but it's not going to be the prototype because it's not going to have a semicolon. Instead, I'm going to start a function body. Opening curly bracket, closing curly bracket. Whatever I put in between those two things, that's going to be the actual code of the function. Anytime you call this function, the code within those curly brackets gets executed. At the end of that function, then it returns back to the calling function. Uh, and, uh, and then you call it again and again and again, or whatever, you, whatever you're going to do. So help me out here. How do you round descents? How did we do it on Wednesday? We what? We multiplied by 100 because $100.51.5, uh, right? We're just going to move that up. Then we're going to reuse the round function in the math library. After we've done that, then we need to shift it back down. So I'm going to go ahead and create a variable here, Re call it result. And I'm going to go ahead and multiply amount by 100. I'm going to end up rounding that. Right? And then I'll divide it by 100 after I'm done. Right? Now, before we go on here, am I going to reach any, or am I going to have any problems here with integer truncation, division? Careful, uh, careful. 100 times, uh, what, what, what is the variable amount? What type, what type of variable is amount? It's a double. So double times an integer is going to be a double. Round returns a double. So double divided by an integer? We're OK here. Right? Now, if you want to be absolutely sure, go ahead and put that point zero in there if you really want to. But we are OK in this case, because at least one of the operands is a double. So we're OK here. Right? Uh, and it also illustrates the, uh, 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 one of the principles of why we are writing functions. Right? Observe. Did I reinvent the wheel here? Uh, did, I, did I look at, OK, I'm going to shift it up. And if it's uh, 0.5 or more, then I'll go ahead and add one and then truncate. Or if it's 0.4 or less, I'll go ahead and just truncate. Did I, did I have to do that kind of stuff? No. That's kind of error prone anyway. There are lots of corner cases that you have to think about. What did I do instead? I reused a function. Why do we write functions again? Code reuse. Don't reinvent the wheel. You don't have to start from scratch. You can use the functions that are already there. I've got a function that is calling another function with a little bit of difference here so that we can get new functionality. Uh, not only, the only, only does our function uh, provide uh, new functionality, but it illustrates code reuse itself. It uses the math library's round function. Right? You don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you just need a, little, a slightly bigger wheel, all right, fine, you can add on to that wheel. Or a different color of wheel, you can go ahead and, and paint that wheel, and you've got a new wheel. You don't have to start over from scratch, though, and reinvent the wheel. Okay. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, again, the, uh, I, got, I have the syntax up here that it repeats. Uh, the signature, uh, and then we've got an actual line of code here. Now, is this going to work for those of you th that have done the required reading and the required watching? Am I done? No. What, is this, what does this function do? It takes input, an amount. Then it computes uh, a result, and so I've got my results in my hand right here in a variable called result. Uh, what should I do with it now? What am, I, what am I doing with it right now? Oh, hey, that's great, and I'm ignoring it. What do I need to do with it? I need to return it to the calling function. Just like with square root, square root, you give it input, you expect output back. y is equal to square root of x, whatever x might be. You're capturing that value. The way that square root is working is it's returning a value back to the calling function so that you can use that. So I'll go ahead and return result. That's the use of the key word. Right? Uh, the function returns. Uh, or specifies, specifies the output value or return value using the keyword return. Right? And then uh, the value you want to return. Right? 
Another observation here, the result variable is a local variable, uh, right? You now, do you remember this, uh, what, what, a, what the variable scope is, right? Scope means that you are limiting the, where the variable exists. The scope of the variable is limited to the function itself. So after this function is done and it returns the value, the variable called result does not exist. I could have function A, function B, function C, and each one of them could have a variable called result, result, result. They all three of them have the same name, but they're completely different functions with their own scope. There's a scope over here with a variable called result in it. There's a scope over here with a variable called result in it. They're not the same variable. Right? So you need to understand that any local variable that you create in here will be gone by the time the function ends. At the end of this function, after it returns something, that variable no longer exists. Only the value is returned, $100.50 or whatever it might be. Right? That value is returned to the calling function, but the, the, the variable itself, it's gone. It, doesn't, it no longer exists. Okay? <coughs> in, general, in general, you can create as many local variables as you want or none at all. For example, I didn't have to do it this way. I could have done it a little bit shorter. How could I have done it a little bit shorter? I could simply just return this value right here. And then I could take the two lines of code and cut it down to just one line of code. I'll leave that in there as an alternative so that you have it in your notes. Uh, it's up to you. It's a style thing at that point. Uh, it, with, with such a short, uh, simple function, I would argue that line 48 is probably preferable uh, because it avoids having to create a, a variable just so that you can return the variable in the very next line. But if your functions get more complex and you've got, say, more than five, six lines, uh, then probably you want some local variables there so that you can, uh, you can keep, every, uh, keep everything in mind rather than just one big, long uh, formula of some sort. Okay. <clears throat> so, in general, you can create as many local variables as you want, or none at all. In addition, the parameter variable itself is a, th that it, in this case, amount is local to the function. That is, this amount right here, that only exists for this function. There might be another variable called amount that you actually give to the function. That is a completely different variable. And we'll see this as a visualization here in a moment, okay? Uh, but that is our definition of round descents. So how do we bring all of this together and actually create a library? Uh, so creating a, creating a library, right? We call this generally modularity. We want to create modules, uh, like uh, live, uh, math.h, that's a module. Uh, basically, anything that you can package a couple of things into it and, 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 and treat them all as one unit, that's a module, right? It's just a, I mean, it's, it's just a, um, an abstraction of abstractions. If I've got a collection of functions, uh, sine and square root and pow and all, well, this, all, this is all math stuff, so let's package it all up and put it into a module. Some languages call these packages, Java calls them packages, uh, Python calls them, I forget, maybe Python calls them packages too. Uh, but you can import things and you can include things external, uh, just like C. Most languages allow you to organize code in either packages or modules or, or libraries or something like that. So how do we do that ourselves? Well, first of all, let's create more than one, very, uh, one uh, 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 function here. So demonstration. Create another, another more general round function. Right. So what I want to do is I want to create a function that has the following uh, behavior. This function, and in fact, here's, this, this is going to be a, kind of a strategy for you guys to uh, design stuff. Uh, write out the documentation first. If you write out the documentation, you basically have identified what this function needs to do. Uh, so if you've got a if you if uh, if you've got a, a large program, you start writing out maybe uh, I, first I need to do this, then I need to do this, then I need to do this, and you start identifying oh well that chunk I could put that into a function. 
Now I can go ahead and write the documentation. Before you even write one line of code, write the documentation of what this function should do. And then that will dictate how the function behaves, right? It allows you to think about it in plain old English abstractly before you actually start writing code. So let me go ahead and propose what this function should do. This function rounds the given value to uh, a decimal place uh, defined by, uh, I don't know, what should we call this? Uh, so uh, I need something to say, you should round it to the nearest hundredth, or you should round it to the nearest tenth or you should round it to the nearest whole number, or you should round it to the nearest tens, right? Around 56 up to 60 or something like that, right? So uh, defined by uh, digit, right? We'll call it digit, uh, but defined by uh, the given digit, right? And another great thing about documentation is that you can give examples. For example, for, uh, let's say, value equal to 123.456, uh, and digit equals, I don't know, uh, let's say uh, two, uh, the it, would, it would round two. And I'm, I'm, writing this, uh, I'm writing this documentation so that you understand what I'm looking for. Uh, if the digit is two, then it should round to the nearest hundredths. In this case, or hundreds, it should round to 100. Here's another example. I'm just going to cut and paste this. For value, value, right? So for digit equals zero, it should round to the regular, uh, regular old round, so 123, right? Uh, that uh, you're rounding to the nearest whole number here. I said two because you're rounding to the nearest 10 to the two, and the nearest 100 value here. So for digit equal to one, it would round it to what? 120, right? Now, now you're getting the pattern here. Negative two, it would round to what? Point four six, right? Where uh, negative two is going to be uh, negative one, negative two, so round to this, uh, this, this digit right here. In other words, this is exactly what we did here, round out up to cents, right? So there's, there's the behavior that I want. I wrote it out, I gave a couple of examples. Now that we understand what I want, we need to actually implement this thing. So in this case, we're just going to have the, uh, uh, the prototype. I don't have to worry about how it's implemented until later. Let's actually write the prototype. First thing on the signature is going to be re the return type. What kind of variable is this thing going to return? Int. Is it going to just return integers? No, not all the time. Sometimes it'll return a double. So we probably want a double return value. Suggest to me a name for this thing. Up here, we called it what it was, round to sense. What should we call this? Can I, can I call it round, for example? Can I call it round two cents, first of all? That, that's not what it is, right? You name your functions what they are. And by the way, what, do you, what, should you, uh, what, what kind of strategy should you use when you're naming your functions? Uh, well, variables are things. Variables are nouns, right? And functions are verbs. They do things, right? They execute things. So name your functions after verbs in general, right? Uh, in this case, it's round to sense. It is doing a rounding to, a sen uh, to the sense. Can I, I can't do that because that's not what it does. Can I call it round? No, why? There's already a round function in the math library. This is what's called polluting the namespace, which we'll talk about here in a moment with function overloading. So, and also it's not pr appropriate because, you know, uh, well, it, it's more than just round. It's rounding to a particular digit. So what should I call it? Round two, digit, okay, I like that. Semicolon at the end, but does it take no inputs? No, it takes at least one input. It takes what? The amount that you want to actually round to. I got, uh, rounds the given value, so maybe we call, we'll call it value instead of amount. Right? I called it amount with uh, uh, round to cents because we're talking about currency. If you say cents, you mean currency, and currency is in amounts. This one is just value. It could, it could be that you're rounding, uh, I don't know, pounds or something like that. All right, and pounds is in like weight or, or kilograms or kilometers or something like that. All right, is there another input here? What? This digit, right? And will that be a double? It could be, right? But is there such thing as the one and a half digit? No, 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 no. that doesn't make any sense. 
So what should I want? To, what, what should I do instead? Int. In general, you use the type of variable that models the problem. Uh, one of the things that we saw in uh, assignment one was using integers when you actually had to use doubles, which led to completely wrong answers. Uh, but the other way of using doubles when you should have used integers, that was more of a design thing. It led to correct answers, but it also led to a bad design because you were using an integer when it, or you were using a double when it w actually was modeled with an integer, right? Like gender, one or two, right? Or uh, age, you generally don't input age as I'm, I'm 27 and a half years old, right? You don't do it like that. You just say 27 or 28 or 29, right? So we'll go ahead and go with an integer here. Now later on in the program, I actually have to implement this. So let me go ahead and go with a different code mode here. Right. And instead of providing the, uh, the function signature, I, I repeat the function signature, but instead of that semicolon that ends the declaration, I actually now have to Im uh, implement this. So suggestions. Well, if it were round to sense, what did we do? We multiplied by 100, right? If I wanted that behavior, what would I multiply it by? With respect to the digit, right? I need to figure out the math here. But probably want to multiply by some power of 10, right? Uh, 10 to the, uh, if, if, if digit here is 2, then I, wanted to, uh, I want to move it, I, I want to shift it down, right? I want to divide by that, uh, that amount, and then, then call the round function, and then correct for it. So let me go ahead and create a, uh, a, a power, right? Uh, int power. And let me go ahead and call the pow function to do that for me. 10 raised to the power of the digit. Right? Now for this example up here, it would be a 100. Right? Uh, for this example, it would be, well, 10 to the 0 is 1. And for this example, it would be 0 0.01. Right? OK, that's my power. Uh, so what do I want to do now, now that I've got this stored in a, ver uh, a variable here? What, what would I want to do with this example right here? I would want to shift this how? I would want to make it into 1.23456. How do I do that now that I have pow? OK, divide by the power, right? Uh, int, or say double result, is equal to uh, value divided by power. Right? Once I've rounded it, what will it end up being? 1.0, right? OK. Now, is that what I want to return? Return result. This, by the way, is just <laughs> a, a whiteboard. Remember whiteboarding? You put it up on the whiteboard so that you can explain it to each other. You can explain it to yourself. If you're alone, of course, you put it on a piece of paper. Uh, now it's at 1, right? And so what do I, do I want to return that value? That's not the value I want to return. What, uh, well, sorry, what, I, I don't have that value. What should I do? I need to call the round function. Uh, and then what should I do with it now? Multiply by the power. Okay, and then return the result. Right? And again, you can simplify this. Uh, I would argue that uh, keeping that power right there, that's a good thing. That's a good uh, uh, local variable, uh, because if not, I would have to cut and paste this pow twice, and then it gets kind of unreadable. If I split it out into two uh, lines here, I definitely understand, oh, well, I'm computing the power, and then I'm using the power in, uh, in, uh, in the expression on line 77. OK? All right. Pretty good. OK? Do we know if these things work right now? Uh, have I done any testing whatsoever? No. So what we need to do is we need to run, uh, we need to, uh, as a first step, we need to do some ad hoc testing. I need to write a program that will actually call this, say, on these values that I came up with in my documentation and see if it actually works. Okay? So to do that, I'm going to go ahead, I, I need to actually start creating some files here. Uh, let me go, actually, let me stay in Atom here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new file called roundutils.h. Right? .h, that sounds familiar. Where have we seen that before? Math.h. Uh, stdio.h. What does the .h stand for? Right. So it, when you're writing your own library, in general, prototypes are placed in what are called header files. Right. General prototypes along 
along with their documentation are placed in header files, files ending in .h. Right? Uh, in general, uh, the, uh, the uh, def uh, function definitions are placed in separate source files with the same, na uh, the same base uh, name, uh, but with a .c extension. And generally, you want to name your files what they contain. We've got two round functions now. Well, actually, we have, we have three. One of them is the math library. We can't change that. But we've got our own two round functions here. One of those round functions is going to be round to sense, and one of those functions is going to be uh, round, to di round to digit. Right? And once I've got two, well, now two is a crowd, I can start putting them into their own modules. And uh, the module, in this case, is going to be round utils. Why do I call it utils? What does that stand for? Utilities, exactly. I could call it round.h if you want to, uh, but round utils is just as good. Right? So let me go ahead and cut and paste my documentation and my prototypes and put them over here in the header file. Right? And the one up here, I want this one. Round to sense and round to digit. Oops, there we go. Order generally does not matter unless, uh, in the header file, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, but the documentation and the prototypes are now in a header file. Uh, we'll talk about the, detail, uh, the, the, the technical details here in a moment, but there's my header file. Now what I need to do is I need to take the definitions and put them into another separate file with the same base name, so roundutils.c for the source file. Uh, and for that, I'm going to just simply cut and paste what we did over here. Right. Should I include documentation in a source file? Uh, around just sense, get, uh, yeah, I'll leave it like this. Uh, we'll change it anyway. Uh, and then where's the, the body over here? Here we go. So should I have documentation in both the header file and the source file? No. DRY, don't repeat yourself. If you had do documentation in multiple places, and then you go back and start changing things, or oops, that was a misspelling over here, right? But you didn't change it over here. Now all of your documentation is out of sync. Keep it in one place so that any changes are in one place so that you're not repeating yourself, okay? So I've got roundutils.h and roundutils.c. Let me go to the command line here and try to compile this stuff, right? You'll see that it's right there, roundutils.c and roundutils.h. Let me go ahead and try to compile it with GCC roundutils.c, okay? Uh, all right, uh, what's wrong? First of all, warning, implicitly declaring library function round. What did I, what did, what did I forget? I, I, didn't, I, I need to do, it with, if I were doing this in main, what would I need to put up at the top? Any libraries that you use. What library am I using here? The math library, so I'll include math.h. Great, okay. Get rid of that, and let's see if it works. All right, well, it got rid of a lot of that stuff, but it's still complaining. What, what's it complaining about? Undefined symbols for architecture, blah, blah, blah. Main. Oh, did you see a main over here? Did you see a main over here in the header file? No. What's re why is main required? What is main required for? To create an executable file, right? It's something that you can actually run. Is this something that can actually run? No, it's just a bunch of library functions, right? Just like li uh, math.h, it's sine, cosine, tangent, square root. None of those things are main. They're, they're, they're intended to be used in other programs. To actually create an executable, you need a main function, right? So that's why it's not compiling into an executable. But I still want to compile it. Do you remember the hyphen C flag that we looked at on the first day or first, oh, maybe it was the second day, I forget? What does it stand for? C, well, not, not the programming language, but C. What am I trying to do here? I want to do what again? I want to compile it. So G, I'm telling GCC, compile this thing, but don't link it in with a bunch of other libraries like the math library to produce an executable file because that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to create a round utils library here. Let me go ahead and do that. All right. No news is good news. What did it end up doing? Roundutils.o. What is that thing? 
It is a Mach O 64-bit object file. Right? So, so now you understand the process a little bit better. If you put a bunch of functions into a header file and source file, you can compile that. And then later on, if you actually need to use those functions in your own program, you can link into it. I've created my own library file here, this object file. Now you understand how math works, how, or math.h works, how uh, stdio.h works. Somewhere sitting on your system, somebody wrote all those functions, compiled them into object files that then GCC simply links into so that you don't have to recompile them every single time you want a new program. Right? And that's what we've done here. Okay? Uh, now there is still an issue here. Uh, if I'm going to include the math library, I also need to include my own library. So I will include my roundutils.h. It's a little bit different syntax here. Uh, with a standard library, I use the langle wrangle, the less than and the greater than symbol. But with a user-defined library, I use the double quotes. And it's just a small technical and uh, mostly stylistic difference, by the way. Uh, the difference is that if you use the langle wrangle, then uh, it's telling GCC, this is a system library. Look in the system location. Right? Uh, by using the double quotes here, it's telling GCC that this is a user-defined library. Look in the current working directory first for that roundutils.o file. And if you don't find it there, then go looking for it in the system, uh, system folder or whatever. Right? It's, it's just a small stylistic difference that tells GCC where to find the stuff that you're looking for. Right? And it also uh, really it, it connotes in, in code that this is not a standard library. This is our own library that we've written here. Okay? So uh, let's go ahead and note all this stuff so far. Uh, once you have this stuff, you can compile without linking. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the library, uh, the library using the hyphen C flag, right? Right. Uh, which produces a, an object file. In this case, it was called roundutils.o. Of course, you can rename it whatever you want. Uh, and, but then uh, to actually compile it with uh, an executable program, that'll be our next step. Uh, in general, uh, you you should use uh, you should use include uh, user library dot h uh, in your code uh, using the double quotes for user defined libraries. Right? You can sometimes get away with the langle wrangle, but uh, uh, it's when you, uh, it's uh, those times when you don't that. Uh, it, it, uh, one percent of the time that it won't work, or, or it, it gives you weird behavior. So just always use the double quotes here instead of the langle wrangle. Right? Now to compile into an actual executable program. Well, first of all, we need an actual executable program. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new file here called round you, uh, de round demo maybe dot, dot c. Okay. Uh, now, this is actually going to be our executable program. So I am going to put a main in here, int argc, arg, char, argv, right? return 0. And now we understand what return 0 is, right? Main is a function. Well, how do you get out of main to go back to the operating system? You return, and well, what do you return? We'll look at the, uh, the uh, error codes later on, but this is zero. Zero is no news is good news kind of thing. There was no error. If you want to exit with an error, you can exit one. That was one type of error. Exit two, that's a different type of error. Exit three, that's a different type of error. And then you put all that stuff in your documentation. Uh, and then people using your program will be able to tell, oh, it exited with this error code of three. That must have mean that this thing happened instead of that other thing that could have happened. right? All right, so uh, what I want to do is I want to test a few values. Double x is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? 0.45, OK? A double y. And I actually want to call that function. Uh, let's go ahead and call round to sense, for example. y is equal to round to sense of x. And printf y is equal to percent f and the line. And we'll just simply print it out, OK? Now, let me go ahead and try to compile this. GCC round demo. There we go. All right, I'm getting the same errors that I did before. Implicit declaration of the function round to sense. Well, why? What was I missing up here? I'm missing my include statements. Include 
But now, before I put, uh, put the other one, do I need to include math here? Do you see any math? Do you see me calling the maths round function? No, I'm only calling the round descents function. Right? So no, you don't, it's not wrong to do this, but it certainly is kludgy and, uh, and, and uh, code that does not need to be there. Right? So if you're not going to use a library, don't bring it in. Instead, I'll just include my library, which was round to, or no, round utils.h. There we go. And once that's in there, this error kind of goes away. Uh, now, well, that, the, the other error goes away, but now what? It's complaining about printf. What am I using? I am, I'm, I am technically using the standard library. And what else? The standard input output library. All right, fine. There we go. All right, all, most of those warnings or errors are gone, but now we've got, still got this. Now it's giving me the, a very similar to error that, that, that we saw before about the main, but it's complaining about this round descents function. Wait a second, I included the header file here. Why is it not finding it? Here's how header files actually work. Do you remember way back when we started our programs and we wanted to define, say, kilometers per hour or kilometers per mile or pi or something like that? Do you remember that we used the hash define pi to th be 3.1415, whatever? Do you remember how I told you that it worked? A preprocessor goes through your code, it sees define pi to be this. And all it does is it does a cut and paste. Anytime it sees pi, it'll do a cut and paste with this number. Cut and paste, cut and paste. Right? So that you're not cluttering up your code with a bunch of magic numbers. The preprocessor also works exactly the same way with header files. All it's doing is going to this header file, doing a cut and paste of that entire file. And the only thing that's in here is prototypes. And it does a cut and paste, and it brings it over here. It replaces line four with a cut and paste of this entire file here. So that it's essentially, you're declaring these functions before you actually use them down here. Right? But that doesn't bring the actual definitions of the functions in. The definitions of the functions are in the .c file, which I've compiled into the .o file. So how do I bring all of these things together? I need to tell GCC where to find everything, round demo .c. Right? So what, uh, what I'm saying is GCC, here's an object file. Here's a, a source file. If I've got like 50 libraries, here are, here, here's a, another .o file, another .o file, another .o file. Bring all these things together and create me an executable. When I do that, it's perfectly happy. And it produces this a.out file. And now I can actually run it. What should I expect, by the way? Uh, I rounded to cents, right? So I should round this to cents. I should expect 123.46. All right, crossing your fingers here. Yay, I got it. All right. So are you sure that everything works? Probably not. You need to do a little bit more testing. Uh, for example, uh, we only tested one thing, right? We never tested this rounded digit, so let's do that. Round to digit, uh, x. I never changed x, so let's round it to 2. What am I rounding there? What, what should I expect now? Let me go ahead and recompile it and run it again. I should expect 100. Yay, it worked. What if I go back in and change this value to negative 2? What should I expect now? What was it? Oh, not a number. Ah, OK. What happened? Maybe it was divide by zero or a very small number. Uh, let's go ahead and go back to the drawing board here and think about this. All right, 10 digits. Anybody see what's wrong? Ah, OK. Good, I thought we were going to have to uh, fire up a debugger early, uh, but nope. All right, so uh, if, if, if you didn't hear what he said, uh, pow returns a double, right? So if I take 10 to the negative, uh, uh, negative 2, what should I get? 0 0.01. OK, what happens? 0 0.01 gets casted into an integer. What is that going to be? 0. So on line 12, when I divide by 0, what am I going to get? Not a number. Okay. So what should I do instead? 
probably a double. There we go. All right, let me go ahead and try it again. Ah, it's still not a number. Why? What did I just recompile? I only recompiled a dot out. Did I change the object file? I changed the source code, but did I ever recompile it into a new object file? No. So GCC C round utils dot o or dot c sorry that produces uh, that updates the round utils dot o and when I recompile that again now okay there we go we get the same exact thing okay so two observations here that was a lot of work just to get two functions working right uh, there are plenty of utilities out there and one of them you'll see on your lab tomorrow that help uh, help out with a lot of this stuff. One of them is called a make file, or the, it's, it's a utility called make. Uh, it is a, another language that basically tells you that you can write out in code that this file depends on these two files. So if these files ever get changed, you need to recompile this file over here. This file depends on this file, this file depends on this file, and this file over here depends on these three files. How does it all get built? Well, I put that into a make file, and then I let the utility take care of it for me. Instead of having to recompile every single time I change something, I just make one a command called make. Make it for me. Right? It's basically a scripting language where you go in. Oh, we're not going to cover it in detail in this course, but you're just going to use it. But if you're interested in, in learning how make works, then you can start dissecting the ones that we gives you, or the, the one that we give you tomorrow in lab. Uh, so that you don't have to re continually do this over and over again and re uh, you know, recompile this, recompile that to produce a, a, a new file. Right? So that's one observation. The second observation I want to make is, wait a second. I got the exact same answer from these two, uh, from the, uh, from these two uh, examples of, of uh, round descents and x rounding it to negative 2, the, the negative 2 digit, if you want to call it that. Uh, is there a way that I could incorporate that idea to simplify my code over here? Hmm. Which one of these functions is more general or more generic than the other? Round to digits is more general. Round to cents, that's way more specific, right? So maybe one of these functions should call the other function. Should round to digit call round to cents? Should the more general call the more specific? Probably not, right? Because then you, it would only ever be call, uh, rounding it to cents instead of sometimes rounding it to a hundreds or rounding it to a thousands or whatever. Okay, so maybe the specific should call the more general. Instead of repeating my code here and violating the DRY principle, maybe I should have this function call the other function. Oops, sorry. All right, return round uh, digit of the amount. And then what digit would I provide it in this sec as the second argument here? Negative 2, just like it did over here in the demonstration. Right? And now when I compile all this together, again, compile, compile, run, I get the same answer. Okay. Likewise, the third observation that I want to make here is this is really tedious. All right, well, I tested it one way. Let's test it another way. Copy pasta, 0. Copy pasta, 2. Right? What would you expect all of these to be? Oh, well, just like the documentation. OK, that looks like it works because it rounds to the nearest whole number. That looks like it works because it rounds to the nearest 100. I could test this for 50 different numbers, doing cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. Right? Uh, this is not too descriptive, though. Right? This is me looking, just looking at the output and saying, yeah, that looks good. Right? Do you think that that is at all scalable? that that's at all rigorous. No. Instead, what you need to do is you need to be writing good test cases, like you did, or like uh, we, we tried to get you to do on lab three, I believe, and that you will be doing it again tomorrow. Uh, for example, uh, you can write, instead of just printing it out here, you can automate this, right? You can say, if y is, what should it have been, uh, is not equal to 123.46, then I can say, printf uh, failed. Expected 123.46, but got percent %f, and then we'll print it out uh, j if it only if it fails, though. Because if it succeeds, I don't want to know about it. I just want to know, yeah, it succeeded. Right? Uh, else, 
printf passed right. and the line and then I'll get rid of this print statement when I do that oh it failed I got uh, so one, one, one thing that you have to do is you have to build in a tolerance and uh, I didn't think I would have to build in a tolerance with this, such a small number but I'll go ahead and put in a tolerance here if the absolute difference between y and the expected value is greater than say 0 0.0001 then we'll say that it failed otherwise we'll say that it passed it, it's it's close enough basically is what we're testing for right. oops and now I am using math so what do I need to do oops <laughs> math.h there we are let's do that again and now I'm getting even better information out of there I just I don't have to look at it and say that looks good that looks good that looks good I say, oh, passed okay I don't have to worry about that right and if I go through and change all of these to the things that look like this, then uh, then uh, I can also keep a counter, right? I can say int num passed, int num failed, right? Zero, and then if it fails, num failed plus plus. Otherwise, num passed plus plus, right? And then I can just have a a, a, a summary at the end, printf. Uh, number failed, percent D, uh, and the line, right? And you get the idea here, num failed, and then, uh, and so if, I'm, if it's zero, maybe that's all I care about. If it's zero, great, I'm good to go, right? Yeah, num failed, great, it passed. Right? Why is this so much better? First of all, I'm not doing manual labor. I'm not looking at that and saying, okay, that worked, that worked, that worked. But not only that, but if I make a change like I did over here, that I changed this one to call the other one, if I make a change, all I have to do is recompile my test suite, run it, and did I break anything? Right? That's called a regression. That if you, uh, all of your tests are passing. 100 passes, zero fails. Uh, and then you go and make a change or something, and then you go back and rerun all your tests. Uh-oh, now one of them's failing. Why? What, what change did I make? What regression did I introduce into the code? You only get this with automated tests like this. Now, this uh, is kind of an ad hoc way of doing it, right? You're just writing your own code. Generally, you want to use a framework for doing this, a unit testing framework. And that's actually what you're going to do next week uh, in lab. We use one, uh, and, and your hack, we use a unit testing framework for C called C Maka. Uh, C Maka is just short for C, I, th I think it was originally called C Mockery. Uh, and a mock is just mock data, right? Fake data that you throw into functions. Uh, and then expect you're, it's not it's not real currency that you're rounding or anything. You just throw it into a function, and then you uh, you see if it passes or not. You use the framework so that you don't have to write all of this code, right? That failed and then increment a counter, pass or increment this counter. Give me a, a summary at the end. It saves you from having to do all of this framework code if you use a unit testing framework instead. Every language has some sort of unit testing framework. Right? and you'll start using them this week, okay? All right, so to compile with an actual executable program, use what we, what we used before was GCC uh, roundutils.o and then rounddemo.c, uh, i.e. I .e. include all object files in the command. Right? Uh, in general, uh, you want to perform a good rigorous and automated testing of your functions called unit testing right. and in general you want to use a formal uh, formal unit testing framework such as example cmaka right. that will that you'll use next week in your lab and in your hack okay uh, another tip, a design tip, uh, functions, uh, functions should be reused as much as possible. Uh, fun uh, in other words, functions should call other functions when appropriate. Right. Don't repeat yourself. Don't, re uh, don't re repeat code that could very, uh, e just as easily, ha you, be you could be calling another function instead. Uh, we used uh, uh, more specific functions can call more general functions. Right? That's just a general design tip. 
It's not always this. Uh, it's not always a, a rule that you have to follow. There are plenty of counterexamples where, yeah, I'm going to cut and paste this code over here because I don't want to. I, I don't actually want to use this entire library and bring in everything uh, because of uh, namespacing issues, which we'll talk about here in a second. Okay. Any questions so far? No. All right then. Other issues that you may have to deal with. Uh, for example, function overloading. In C, when you create a function, that function is what's called globally scoped. Right? Uh, the function exists everywhere. Consequently, um, uh, uh, functions, uh, you, you cannot name a, uh, two functions with the same name. Uh, this is called polluting the namespace. Polluting the namespace refers to the fact that once you have reserved a name for a function, that name cannot be used by any other function. Some languages allow you to do uh, to uh, not have to do this. Right? They support what's called function overloading right? right function overloading is where you can have one function that's named foo and another function named foo with different inputs and or sometimes different outputs uh, I can name a function foo and it takes an integer I can name a function foo and it takes a double and the compiler knows the difference between those two functions because when you call it and you pass it an integer it means oh you meant that first foo or, oh, you, you passed a double, you must have meant that last foo. Right? C does not support that. One prime example, in the math library, in the math library, there are several absolute value functions. Do you remember what they are? Abs, right, for integers. Fabs for, fabs for do doubles or floats. Labs for long, right, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, if I bring up my documentation here, man, um, abs, there you go. Abs, see also, oh, it's not in here. Uh, man, uh, fabs, there we go. That's because it was in the standard library. I also have fabs L, fabs F, and what else do I have? Uh, those are others. Man, labs, I think I've got labs and la labs, man, la, la labs. For long longs, yep. So I've got like a dozen different functions that all do the same thing. They all compute the absolute value of a number. They all are different in their names and the types of numbers that they, they take the absolute value of. Longs, integers, floats, doubles, long floats, long longs, etc., etc., etc. Right? So in C, because you don't have function overloading, without function overloading you are forced to name your functions with different uh, pre, uh, prepended uh, or prefixes, sorry, fixes or suffixes. Right? In this case, we prepend it with an F to indicate that it's for floating point numbers. We pre, uh, prefix it with an L to indicate that it's for longs, or la labs, two Ls, for, uh, for long longs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Basically, we are pro we're polluting the namespace over and over and over again. Uh, we have to uh, if we want a function that does the exact same thing but on a different type of variable uh, for an integer or for a double or whatever, we have to create a brand new function, give it a completely different and unique name, and that's because we don't have function overloading. In other programming languages, we do have function overloading. For example, in object-oriented programming languages like Java that you'll learn next semester. Uh, Java does support function overloading. Its math library has four or five different absolute value functions, but guess what? They're all named abs. And the reason for that is that it's, it's called dynamic dispatch. Uh, if you call math.abs on an integer, it knows, oh, okay, well, you probably meant to call the one that takes an integer. So I'll compile it that way. You called uh, abs on a, a, a floating point number. You probably meant that function over there that takes a floating point number. So I'll compile it that way for you. It's called static dispatch. It's not something that is, uh, is built into C because C is not fundamentally an object-oriented programming language. 
this is an object-oriented programming con language concept, and we don't have it in C. So um, in practice, uh, you resolve uh, a pol a pollution of the namespace by using prefixes or suffixes, uh, like I said before. Uh, for example, if you've got an entire library, later on we'll look at a library for graphical user interfaces called GTK. Uh, every function has a GTK underscore prepended to it. Uh, for example, create window. Right? Uh, create window here. You might have library, uh, like five different libraries that you're using in a very complex application. Uh, and uh, each library might define a function called create window. Well, if you've got a create window function over there in that library and a create window function over there in that library, can you use those two libraries together? Not without great difficulty. Uh, because they have a function with the same name that does different things. We don't have function overloading, so consequently, generally what, uh, what library uh, authors do is they prefix everything with a GTK underscore. Now, you're not going to have to do this in this class, uh, but uh, if you are, uh, it, it explains why, uh, uh, like when we get to GTK, why, uh, why, is a G why do I have to write GTK underscore every single damn time for every single function? And it's because C does not have function overloading. Uh, this is their solution to uh, solving the, the namespace issue, the, the, the pollution of the namespace issue. Okay? All right, that's function overloading. Uh, let's see, what else? Other issue. Um, the void keyword. Right? So functions that take uh, functions uh, that return uh, no value are called void functions. Right? Uh, in general, or you know, you uh, when you declare such a function, use the keyword void as the return type. You still should uh, have a return statement. It's just that it doesn't return. Any, it, it just uh, it doesn't return anything. So, for example, return. How do I indicate nothing? By typing nothing. Return. End it. Right. Uh, what what does it return? Where where is my cursor blinking right now? What's there? Nothing. It doesn't return zero. It doesn't return a variable called foo. It just returns nothing. And so you have a, a void function that doesn't return a value, and you, you still have a return statement, though. Uh, and uh, if, if you need like a function to just do something for you, and it, you don't, you're not expecting anything back, you can have a void function. Functions with no input values, uh, input parameters, I should say, uh, can also use the, vo uh, the void keyword, the void keyword. For example, let me go ahead and go into code mode here. Uh, void, foo, void, <laughs> right? There you go. So this is a function called foo. It takes no inputs and it gives no outputs. It just does stuff maybe, right? Uh, but in general, in general, it is better to omit the void keyword for parameters. For example, void, foo, nothing is much better, right? Now you still have to use void if the return type is nothing, if it's void. Uh, but if it takes nothing, well, don't write anything. <laughs> write nothing instead. You can uh, explicitly use the void keyword. There are a little bit of technical differences, uh, but nothing that we're going to, to focus on in this course. This is definitely the preferred way of doing it, right? Okay. All right. So. With our few remaining 15 minutes or so here, we're going to have to revisit this next time. Uh, but I'll go ahead and go into a, a second uh, header here. Uh, how do functions actually work? Okay. So here's where we're going to start getting into some technical details that you may not see in other languages, but that in every almost every language, it works exactly the same. It's just that it's more opaque in other languages where you don't have to worry about the details. Uh, every program has what's called uh, has uh, programs have what is called uh, a program stack. Okay, so what is a stack? Don't don't worry about program stacks for now. What is just a stack? Uh, 
What do you think of when you think of a stack? I had pancakes last night, so what was I thinking? A stack of pancakes, right? Uh, well, what else do you stack? Now that we're thinking about food, think about the cafeteria. What do you eat on? Plates, plates right? How are plates stored at your cafeteria? In a stack, right? How does it work, right? You take a bunch of plates. First of all, is it a stack like this? Uh, do you have to reach out way up here? No, what, what is it? There's one of those uh, mechanical ones that has a spring, right? You put, take, a uh, take a plate and you put it on top and you push it down, right? Uh, and then there's a spring in there that the entire stack is being held and you take a plate off the top. Can you, can you I'm, I'm sure that you can, it, it, it's not advisable. I don't know if they're, they're probably not glass in the cafeterias, are they? Okay, so the, yeah, they're not gonna break or anything, but can you reach into the, me uh, the mechanism and pull something out from the bottom? I don't like that plate on top. It's, it's dirty or something, or it's, mm, the color displeases me or something. So do, do, you, do you jump down to the middle of the stack and grab that plate? No, what's the only plate that you can grab? The one on the top, right? If I need to put more plates on, do I, put the, do I take the stack and I, do I put, insert it in the middle? If it were standing on a, a, a table, is that how you uh, insert a plate? No, what would happen? It would probably fall over, right? A program stack is exactly the same. A program stack is a, it, it's a, 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 it is a LIFO, which is a last in, first out data structure, right? LIFO means that the last one that you put on, in other words, the last dish that you put on top, that's the first one that you're gonna take off the top. There's no inserting or removing from the middle. There's no inserting or removing from the bottom. You're only allowed to put stuff on the top and take the stuff off the top, right? Uh, there, the only operations allowed are push and this is placing something, placing something on top of the stack. And we call the other one pop, right? Uh, removing something from the top of the stack, right? No access, uh, no access to middle elements is allowed. Right? Otherwise your stack would fall over, okay? Now what, in the context of a program, what is a program stack? Each time a function is called, a new, what's called a stack frame is created and placed on top of the stack, of the program stack, right? Each time a function returns to the calling function, the topmost stack frame is popped. There we go, popped. Right. So why is this a good thing? Function A calls function B, calls function C, calls function D. How do I get back to where I started? We call these breadcrumbs. Why do we call them breadcrumbs? Hansel and Gretel, you remember Hansel and Gretel? What did they do? They went into the forest, right? They're, they were led off into the forest to die or whatever. Uh, and uh, they, they, uh, they left breadcrumbs behind them, uh, right, right, to lead their way back home. Well, of course, the breadcrumbs were eaten and whatever. Uh, but the, the bread, if it had worked, you, you would have been able to turn around and see your path back. Program A calls program, or sorry, uh, function A calls function B, calls function C, calls function D. What we have is a stack frame for function A, stack frame for B, C, and D. In other words, these are our breadcrumbs for how to get back to, uh, to our point in the program where we called this function. All we have to do is pop off the top stack frame and the next stack frame that was right under it, that's, uh, that's the context for which we, wh that's where we came from, right? All you have to do is reverse your direction, pick up your breadcrumb and continue on back home, assuming that nobody ate your breadcrumbs. And that's why this program stack is so useful. It, it gives an, an extremely efficient way of keeping track of which function is calling which function. Now, each stack frame contains all the local variables and all of the parameters, right? What I wanna do now is I wanna give you an example. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll do it this way. So I've got this nice uh, visualization set up. Right, let's go ahead and, I don't know how long it'll take to actually load this up. Uh, okay, not, not too long at all here. So uh, let's, look, uh, let's look at the code first of all. Unfortunately, it's kind of small. There we go. 
There we go. So I've got a main function here uh, that has a double n, which has a value of 10, double m, which has a value of 16. Uh, we're we're going to compute the average of these two functions. Now, I've got a, a, a function here called or, uh, uh, average of these two values. We've got a, a function called average and a function called sum. This is just for illustration purposes. If you just wanted to add two numbers together, don't write a function to do that. Just say a plus b. If you want to do an average, just a plus b divided by 2. Th that's the better code. All right? So this is terrible code, but it's a good code to illustrate the ideas here. So we've got n and m. And I pass those to another function called average. Average is going to have its own stack frame with its own variables, a, b, and y. That calls another function, sum. So I've got function calling function calling function. What it means, uh, that means that stack frame after stack frame after stack frame is going to be created, each with its own context. Let me go ahead and zoom out here so that we can see this. I'm going to step through this uh, line by line. Right? So what I've got over here is the stack. I've got my main function right here. This is, this is main's stack frame. It's got all of its variables, argc, argv. Right? There's only one arg, uh, argument. Uh, that is a poop emoji there because it's uninitialized. That's what they decided to use for uninitialized values instead of, remember what we, what we called it? Dead beef, right? So instead, dead beef, uh, instead of dead beef, they're using a poop emoji instead. Ha ha. Uh, then, we've got, uh, then we initialize n to 10, m to 16. And then we end up calling average. What's going to happen is a brand new stack frame is going to be created on top of it. Now, the way that they visualize this, it's just going to appear down here. And instead of bottom up, it's going top down. But it doesn't matter, because if you want to visualize it as going up, just take your computer and turn it upside down. It doesn't really matter, does it? Right? It's not like the actual physical memory is growing in one direction or another direction. So now I've got my new stack frame here. It has the variables a, b, and y. Right? And they're not initialized yet until I actually go into the function. It received the values 10 and 16. So one observation here. This stack frame has variables n and m with the same values as these because these values were passed to this function up here. Now, if I uh, go to the next line, we're actually going to call another function. So another stack frame will appear here right, for the sum function. When I step into that, it gets 10 and 16. How many variables called a do I have at this point? Two. But they live in different scopes. One of them lives in the average stack frame, and the other one lives in the sum stack frame. They are completely different variables, completely different scopes, and they could have completely different values. In this case, they don't, but they could. Right? Let me go ahead and go one more step here. So 26, it was, that, that's what sum did. It just added them together, and it returned the value. Now, I'm about to return to the calling function. Main calls average calls sum. So what's going to happen when I return? What's going to happen to this stack frame right here? It's going to be, now, come on, there we go. It's going to be destroyed. Right? Why? Because we're reversing our breadcrumbs. We went from function A to function B to function C. When we start returning, we go from C to B to A in the exact reverse order. The way that we do that is simply by destroying these stack frames. Right? And when I return from average, then that stack frame gets destroyed. And now I'm back at the main. Uh, the average was 16 because it's 26 divided by 2. right? And then we print that out, and we see the, uh, the result up here. Right? Now, this is a nice interactive visualization tool. Uh, the textbook, uh, which, which I, uh, I pulled this from, uh, usually stacks are depicted like real world stacks. right? You stack to uh, bottom to top. And so we've got basically the program code is what gets loaded up first. Then global variables and static content. For example, if you've got hello world, hello world is a static string that gets stored somewhere in memory. Well, it gets stored on top of your program code. And then main has a stack frame. On top of that, average has a stack frame. On top of that, sum has a stack frame. We've got function calling function calling function. A new plate is placed on top each time. When you return from these functions, these plates get popped off. Right? Just like we saw in the, uh, the, in the visualization tool there. Right? Uh, th that way, when, uh, when, this when sum returns, it gets pushed, uh, popped off the top. And now where are we? Well, we're in the average function now. 
When it gets returned, that gets popped off the top, and now where are we? Well, now we're in the main function. Right? Those variables are destroyed. You can't get them back unless you've returned the var value. Uh, and th there's no way. Uh, it could be that they're still there. It could be that they were wiped out. It could be, it could be dead beef. Right? Those stack frames are, for all intents and purposes, they've been destroyed. Those uh, variables A and B, they're gone. Right? You cannot access them. Okay. So one consequence of this, uh, and one, the last thing that we'll do today is we'll take a look at this, is the following program will not work. Let me go ahead and cut and paste this so that I don't waste our time typing it all out again. Uh, here we go. Now before I run this, let's see what it should be doing. Okay? I've got in my main, I've got A and B, which is 10 and 20. I print them out. What would, what would you expect if I printed them out right there, uh, right at line 13? It would print out 10 and 20. I call this swap function. What does swap do? It takes A and places it into a temporary variable. Then it takes B and places it into A. Then it takes the temporary variable and places it into B. Let me go ahead and print it there. What should it print on line 6 after I've swapped them? 20 and 10. Okay. Then I return from the function on line 17, and I print them out again. What, should, what, what, what would you expect it to print? If you've swapped 10 and 20, it should print 20 and 10, right? Let's find out what really happens. So the first one, we were right, 10 and 20. In the side of the function, we've swapped them, 20 and 10. But over here in the calling function, have we swapped them successfully? No. Why is that? I asked you before how many variables uh, called A were there. I'll ask that again. How many variables are there here in this program called A? Two. The first one is on line 13. What's its scope? Where does it live? It lives in the main function right here. Where's the second A variable? Right here on line two. Where does it live? It lives in the swap function. Two different stack frames, two different scopes, two different variable names with or variables with the same exact name. Right? I could drive home the point, uh, the, the, the point that these are indeed different variables by giving them a different name, x and y, x, y, and y. There you go. And then I can't print this anymore. So oh, uh, I, I could, I could go x and y. Right. There we go. Uh, and then let's, pr let's change this to x and y have been swapped. Now, I'll ask the question again. How many variables are there named a? Now how many? Just one in the main. I've actually renamed this one x up here to drive home the point that this variable, uh, these two, this x, y variable right here, these are not the same variables as a and b. Why? Because they're in completely different stack frames. Every time you call a function is a brand new stack frame with its own scope. Right? Gee, I really want to be able to swap, fun uh, swap variables. Right? How do we do that? We need pointers, and we'll start that on Wednesday.